So we're about to pull down this shock absorber and make some changes, but we thought it'd also be a good opportunity to show you guys sort of what, what's involved and what's inside a shock absorber and how it all works together. the dial here and then the base nut so being that this is a strut we actually use an inverted monotube damper so we've got a 45 mil body here and then a 12.5 mil shock rod so all of the dynamic load is taken by the guide bearings and the body rather than the shock rod. And then because of this, we can use a smaller rod overall, meaning we can run a lot higher static gas pressure, meaning we get more damping response overall. So normally in a conventional style damper, you'd see the bump stop outside of the shock. However, in our case being an inverted monotube, we have the bump stop internal of the strut tube itself. So we have different bump stop lengths depending on stroke and depending what the application is. In this case, we use a, around a 40 millimeter bumper and that way we get a nice progressive end of travel into, into block. So depending on what the, what the application is, but so we use uh, usually generally a longer, longer travel bump stop to have a much more progressive end of travel rather than having 50 or 60 mil of compression travel overall and then a very hard hit to end of travel. So we, we use the bump stop actually as a compression aid in a lot of our tuning. A bump stop isn't just a rubber block that stops metal noise when you're hitting a large input. A bump stop can definitely be used as a compression aid, for sure. We gotta pull off this nut. This just stops essentially the rod from shooting out from the bottom of this here. We've had different designs and there's a whole bunch of different, this isn't the rule for aftermarket dampers. This is just how we do it ourselves. And then most importantly, we gotta drop the gas because being that we run such a small 12.5 mil rod, we actually run 300 psi of nitrogen gas pressure. So if you happen to forget to drop that and uh, take this top package off, you're, we're gonna fill your workshop in all kinds of hydraulic oil. So we wanna drop that gas. You get used to it after a while, but some people still get the uh, And now we crack the top cap, always just as a safety measure. I push down on the rod to make sure that there's no pressure left in it. So we just crack that top nut here. Now we're pulling out the piston and rod assembly out of the actual cylinder tube. And this is what dictates, so oil is passing through a piston the discs control how fast the oil flows through the piston and this essentially dictates how your car rides and handles. So you can change the MVH of a car with a different different duro bush or different sway bars or springs but this will have the biggest effect on how you feel that speed bump, how you feel that little trough in the road. This changes whether a car feels nice to drive or whether it feels like it was made off eBay. Now we're going to Put it in the rod vise, pull the piston off, pull the piston nut off, and see how it all works. Right now, this this is essentially just a rebound stopper here that we use. These don't really have any impact on how a how a shock performs. So then, from here, we have our pivot disc. The width of the pivot disc dictates how much high speed force we have, how fast the, the damping force generates into its higher velocities. So the wider the pivot disc is, the more high speed damping you're going to get. Then from here we have, there are 50 different names for these. I call them like flex discs, but everyone has their own name for them. This is essentially what gives you the overall force. This is what flexes, but instead of flexing, it's not flexing in any sort of round way, the whole disc actually needs to stretch. So these two build billions of cycles in their life. So the actual 
The material they're made of is very important in how they're finished. See, these are actually rumbled, so there's all smooth edges where are some of the cheaper dampers, that a lot of companies have addressed it now, but some of the cheaper dampers will still have stamp marks where there ends up being claw edges, but I'm pretty sure the world's kind of caught up to this technology now, but you'll see that the actual finish is almost polished and smooth, so there's less friction between surfaces, and uh, it's very durable, where we can, we can measure a damper that's three years old and we'll have lost less than 3% of force kind of thing. We make changes in 0.5 of a millimetre thickness increments. So we have the thickness and then the width of the disc. So you can either have a symmetrical stack where you have, see we have three 30 mil discs here. However, you can then set it so you have a 30 mil flexing around a 26 mil flexing around a 24 mil and this is what's called a pyramid stack and this changes how fast, essentially this will affect the gradient of the damper. So how you build the discs is how you want the damper to perform. If you need more high speed force, if you have a much higher spring rate, then you'd usually go with a symmetrical stack. However, if you're running a more conservative spring rate, you want the damper to be more digressive, then we use a pyramid stack. But it's very complex and also very simple. One rule doesn't mean everything, so it really depends on what your intended outcome is. So before I explain this disc, it's better off that I explain what the piston is. So this is actually a digressive piston. So we have 0.5 of a mil hub to seat height difference here. So with this, we can actually preload the disc stack, meaning that before we have any, allow any oil to pass via the disc, it takes a certain amount of force to break it away. Where a lot of the earlier technologies ran a linear piston, and a linear piston still does have a place in some motorsport applications, but for us, we generally 95% of the time, we'll use it aggressive. So because we have 0.5 of a mil hub to seat height difference here, we then have different shims of different thicknesses to change how much preload we can run. With our piston, we have a 0.5 of a mil hub to seat height difference, and we have spacer discs here ranging from 0.4 of a mil thick to 0.15 of a mil thick. However, the 0.15 mil thick disc isn't as durable as the others, so we only use these in extreme motorsport cases, and for most road cars, we use a 0.2 at an absolute maximum. So from there, we have the piston. We actually have a bonded seat here, so a lot of dampers have just what is essentially a piston ring. However, we've found from tuning for OEM car companies that you can actually get noise and also almost like a piston slap where you will actually hear a subtle tinging in compression. So this is actually a bonded sleeve here, which then has an O-ring underneath it. So it actually has a really tight seal against the, the, the shock body overall. So we have oil trying to pass through this here, hole here, which would be in the rebound stroke, and then this hole here, which would be the compression stroke. And the thickness, width of the disc, how much preload, and what width the pivot disc is, dictates how fast and at what velocity that oil can pass through that hole. There's only a few parts that you need to change, but being that the changes are so incremental, there are an almost infinite amount of ways to tuner damper. Like a chessboard only has so many pieces, there is also infinite moves that can be made within that realm. So even something as simple as a piston has so many different design differences in it and different qualities. So this we actually use a sintered metal, that's why it kind of has this black finish here. So this is a powdered metal that's then heat, heated and then pressed to get this design and then from there it's CNC'd. We have chamfered edges here, so we reduce cavitation. Also, with a, the sharper the edges, you end up getting noise through the actual piston, so we can run this damper up to two meters a second and it's still whisper quiet on the dyno, which means as you go over a speed bump, you're not going to hear that suspension noise. So from there, we also, all of the, as you can see, all of the surfaces are very smoothed. Even the leading edges into the hole, they've been, they're elliptical and smoothed out. Uh, a lot of design and, uh, a lot of work has gone into this, so please, if any of our competitors are watching this, please don't copy it. So here we have our adjustment tip. For We don't actually need to change this for what we're doing now, but we figured while we have it apart, we'd show you guys. So the hole, the size of this hole, the diameter of this hole, dictates how wide the adjustment system is. The smaller the hole is, the smaller the range is. And while some people would think the wider the hole, the better, there is also so much as too much bleed in a piston. Therefore, you end up getting a car that's wallowy on a road. So some cars, especially dependent on leverage ratio, we can actually close this hole up. So we have this, and this is essentially just a bypass hole made out of brass. 
Then from there, tap this out. So, this is our adjuster tip. If anyone's ever pulled apart a carby at home, they'd be familiar with the needle and seat. That's essentially what this adjustment system is. So this is a radius that's been generated. So all of the adjustment steps are even across the board. And this essentially just open and closes against that to allow oil to bypass the piston. So from there, depending on the length of the rod, we have a adju different adjuster rod length here. And then this is, a this is just a clicker essentially with a a slug rolling up and down in internally to change how deep it's going. So all we have is a, a clicker on a dial that changes the height of a slug internally with a thread, drops this down, which changes the height of this, which then opens and closes the port. And because we run so much gas pressure, we don't need something to then feed this needle up because it's such a pressurized vessel, the gas pressure alone will force this away from that hole. So the radius of the, the adjustment tip changes the the range or the ratio in which it adjusts however for all of our adjustment systems we always just use a linear where it's one click is uh eight percent of the damping force overall so this is the opposite end of this so the oil is traveling through here you can see if you can just make out inside that we've got the adjustment tip in there and this is the two ports where the oil then relieves through because we have such a reactive piston being that we have preload on this disc it can tend to what we refer to as copy the road, where over small input changes, the, the wheel won't release and you'll get the, the body copying as the car's going down the road. So by having an oil bypass bleed like this, even though it seems very simple, it's the easiest way to relieve oil pressure past the piston. So instead of having a reactive car, we can relax it, have a car that breathes down the road, and then have an adjustment system where once you wind the car up, it becomes very reactive. So especially if you're going around Phillip Island or Sydney Motorsport Park, you can really have a much higher response, responding damper and you can keep the body sucked into the road. So we're putting back together. This is one thing I didn't describe, but this is the rebound stop. So this has a very hard rubber coating on the back side of it. And this is essentially just so when it tops out, it doesn't have any sort of metallic thud or noise. So then we have our pivot, pivot disc that we put on. And it's not just the width, but then the thickness of the disc, which can then dictate how far the disc can travel. The further it travels, the, the less high speed gain there is overall in the very high velocities. However, if we tra over travel the disc too much, it essentially overstretches and then the, the life of the disc is severely reduced. So we're gonna put this one on, the pivot disc. Awkward hands today. And then we're putting on our base bleed disc. Now this is, we use a base bleed disc. So even on full hard, we still have a small amount of oil bypass. For some race cars with very high amounts of error or depending on the application, sometimes we choose to not use a base bleed disc at all. However, in this case, being that it's a road car, we still want a little bit of bleed there as a preventative measure. Then the preload disc goes back on. We have our piston. Preload disc, flex discs, Americans call them shims, but it just doesn't seem right to me. Pivot disc goes back on, our rebound stop, our piston nut, which we use a very light duty Loctite on because uh, we don't want rods exploding from dampers anytime soon. Usually in the, in the workshop, I use an electronic torque wrench. However, on the road, I use a pretty basic large scale torque wrench. And uh, even though it seems coarse, I've never had a piston come loose, especially with the help of some Loctite. So I do this up to 30 Newton meters, which given the size, of the size and pitch of the thread is bang up. Then the adjuster tip goes back in. Sorry, let me move this out of the way. The actual tip. So the oil we use is a hydraulic oil that is has a very controlled viscosity, so it doesn't change weight dependent on heat. It has anti-cavitation, anti-foaming agents in it, and uh, it's uh, 
a marvel as far as the temperature changes versus the damping force. We can get a damper to 80 degrees and have almost immeasurable damping force change. So it means regardless of whether you're taking the first turn or you're taking the seventh lap, the car is going to handle the exact same. We're gonna put the piston and rod assembly into the cylinder here. Now, just like a brake system, the shock also has to be bled of air because any air equals lag, essentially. So we're gonna initially bleed it through with the adjustment tip open, so it's easier to get air through. So we bleed it through usually about five times before we actually cap it off, so I wanna drive it up and then wind the adjuster so all of the oil is forced to bypass the piston and then we bleed it through and hopefully you can see little air bubbles coming up through here as you can see around the edge but you'll see that because of the actual anti-foaming agent that these bubbles break away very quickly. And we'll give that a couple more cycles and then cap it off. So now we're going to put the top package on and we've got to make sure that there is enough oil in the actual cylinder itself so that when we put the cap on we get some oil bleeding through. Alright, so we gassed this cylinder with 300 psi of nitrogen pressure. It has a dividing piston to separate the oil from the gas and what the gas does is energise the oil column. So instead of compressing the oil and having a lag there between where the piston moves and where the oil compresses because we've energized it with so much gas force the damper works almost instantaneously or for any tech heads we can build 80 percent of damping force within three millimeters of rod travel at one meter per second so that is almost a immeasurable amount of rod travel for peak force so depending on where the adjustment is we can change the range of response in the shock. I've got my little gas rig here. You want to make sure it's sealed because as I said this is 300 psi of nitrogen. So now we're going to let gas into the chamber here and then you'll see over here that the rod expands as it builds pressure. With a 15 millimeter rod we only run 1,600 kilopascals, where with a 12.5 mil rod we run 2,000, 2,100. So, depending on how much volume is increased by the rod versus the cylinder, we change how much gas pressure is needed to energise the column. So, we're going to put our bump stop on first. Our spacer nut. It's funny, for everything else I always use a torque wrench, but... You're not going to torque wrench that up. Now we put the cylinder over the top. Make sure we don't pinch the seal. Make sure you don't pinch the seal. Do that up. We have a coil that goes over the shock. That's why it's called a coilover. A coilover does not mean that it's adjustable. A coilover, there's so many factory coilovers out there. A coilover just means the coil is over the shock. It's pretty. And then from there, we have our spring seat. We use a, a radial bearing here. So all of the steering force is put through this bearing rather than the top mount bearing through here. So you get less, um, torque build up as you're, as you're steering. So we also have a, a nylon seat here for our, our locking rings, which helps the locking rings slide up and down and doesn't let the spring eat into the top of the spring seat here by having a free, a free spin. It also reduces the chance of the, the locking ring seize overall. So here we're just gonna compare the difference in the strut tops. So with this, this is a fixed adjustment here. There's no camber adjustment and we have a rubber bush here. So what having a rubber bush does is it isolates a small amount of the road input into the rubber bush rather than directing it through the chassis. However, we've found that for the pickup you get in steering response and overall body control, that small amount of MVH, especially when going to a coilover, it's worth just going to a spherical bearing. Also by having a spherical bearing, particularly in drift cars where you've got large changes in caster, camber and steering angle, having, having the pillow ball means that there's a lot, less, a lot less steering bind through the shock body overall. So with our camber adjustment compared to other people, we actually have a clamping plate assembly where I've had customers 
email me and say, hey, or, or call me saying, oh, you don't have a camber adjustment bolt here, but we're, what we have is a, a clamping plate. So our sliding assembly is actually in the second plate and then these bolts stay fixed, meaning that if we want to add more camber or more caster, we're not limited to the hole cut out in the body to adjust that. These bolts stay fixed and then the body slides underneath that.